We will start off our uh, unit on biotechnology by learning some of the basic processes involved in biotechnology and, and basically a definition of biotechnology as well. And so the, this whole unit will be based around Chapter 12, which is about DNA technology and genomics, and we'll be looking at different facets of this, of this topic as we move through the, through the chapter. So first of all, we need to define what biotechnology is. It is the manipulation of organisms or their components to make useful products. Now, you might think bio, biotechnology is a new science, a new branch of science, and actually it's not really very new. It's been around for thousands of years because for thousands of years people have used various kinds of biological processes to make various products. For instance, using yeast to make wine and cheese, to selectively breed stock or dogs, or other animals, or even to um, cross-pollinate uh, plants with each other. There are lots of different things that that fall under the realm of biotechnology that you wouldn't normally think of. What we usually think of as, bi as biotechnology will be what we'll, we'll focus on more in this unit, and that's about DNA technology. So specifically, this is the modern techniques that are used to study and manipulate genetic material. And there are various kinds of things, some of which you've heard of, some of which you may not have heard of that we'll be talking about. So first of all, gene cloning, okay? What we do in genetic engineering is we're manipulating genes for some kind of purpose. And so what, what gene cloning allows us to do is to make multiple copies of a gene, um, <clears throat> the pieces of DNA that carry the genes, in other words, and that's oftentimes done by a process called recombinant DNA. And this is formed by joining nucleotide sequences or DNA sequences from two different sources. There's one source that will contain the gene that we're going to clone, and another source will be the gene carrier called a vector. And there are various ways, various types of vectors that can be used. Um, the one that's most commonly used for a lot of purposes in uh, biomanufacturing of these days is something called a plasmid, which is the small extra piece of DNA that you find in prokaryotes. And so we'll be looking at how that works. So the steps involved in cloning a gene, there are several different steps here. And we're going to look at something in just a minute to talk about that. But we're going to isolate the plasma DNA from the species that we're going to use, the species of bacteria. We're going to find the gene of interest that we need to include. And we're going to isolate that. We're going to treat both the plasmid DNA and the DNA with the target gene with a restriction enzyme, which sometimes we call that molecular scissors, that cuts the DNA in a certain place, and we're going to produce the fragments of DNA with our target gene on there. We're going to mix that together with the plasma that has also been cut with the same restriction enzyme, and we're, they're going to be caused to join together and produce, that's going to produce DNA molecules, or recombinant DNA molecules, um, and then the DNA ligase the molecular tape will basically join the plasmid and the target segments together and then will cause a bacterial cell to pick up that recombinant plasmid and that's going to be um, reproduced every time that bacteria undergoes binary fission and will end up with a group of genetically identical cells descended from a single ancestral cell and that's going to have our gene in it and then we can grow those bacteria in culture and have it produce our protein that we want it to make. So let's look at some pictures about how this works. This is an overall uh, view of the process that we're going to take the plasmid, combine it with the gene from another source, and then cause that to be taken up by the bacteria and then grown in culture. So here we have, first of all, we isolate the plasmid from the bacteria and we isolate the DNA of the cell that contains the gene of interest. The part we're interested in is just this little bitty red piece right here, not the rest of the genome. That's all we want. We're going to treat both of those with a, with a restriction enzyme, the same restriction enzyme. We're going to produce something called sticky ends, and we'll talk about what that means uh, in the next couple of days. We're going to cut the cell's DNA with the same enzyme, and we're looking at that piece right there that has our gene of interest in it. Then we're going to put those things together, kind of combine them together under, under the right kind of circumstances so that they will join together with DNA ligase to make a recombinant plasmid. This is recombinant because it has the bacteria's GNA, uh, DNA that's already there plus the DNA from the outside source that has our gene of interest in it. And then we're going to um, cause the bacteria to pick up that recombinant plasmid through transformation. As the bacterium reproduces, it produces lots of copies that all contain that gene of interest. And then we can f uh, harvest that gene to uh, make proteins directly. We can harvest it to be inserted into other organisms via this bacterium. And uh, there are lots of different things we can do with it. What are some examples of things that have been done this way? Well, things like, like uh, insulin has been made this way. Restriction enzymes are 
molecules that, they're enzymes that cut the DNA at specific sequences. There are a number of different ones that can be used. Each enzyme binds to the DNA at a different site called a restriction site. And a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them make staggered cuts that produce uh, fragments that have these st single-stranded ends called sticky ends, and they readily join together uh, much more easily than if you just had a blunt end together. And then the enzyme DNA ligase joins the fragments together. So here is the process of using a restriction enzyme. Okay, so we've got, this is the restriction sequence right here, the recognition sequence, and the enzyme is going to cut this particular one between the G and the A here and the G and the A here. Notice that the letters on one side of the DNA, G-A-A-T-T-C, are reversed on the other strand, G-A-A-T-T-C. This is called a palindrome, and restriction enzymes look for specific sequences of palindromes uh, and cut the DNA in a certain place within that pal palindrome. So when it cuts here, we'll have two pieces of DNA. Each has a single-stranded end with T-T-A-A -A as the base sequence. When we put another DNA fragment in there that's cut with the same restriction enzyme with our gene of interest in it, then when they join together, they'll stick together. That'll be complementary to this, and this will be complementary to that, and then we have DNA ligase that will paste them together, and then we end up with our recombinant DNA molecule. Now this is really handy with bacteria. It's a little bit different with, with um, eukaryote DNA. And eukaryote DNA is processed before it leaves the nucleus. The, actually, the messenger RNA is processed, okay? Um, the messenger RNA is modified so that you've got extra nucleotides added on the ends, forming a cap, which is guanine at one end, of the, one end of the molecule, and a tail, which is 50 to 250 adenines in a row at the other end. And then the RNA is going to be spliced. We have, we have seg uh, segments or stretches of non-coding DNA within the, within the DNA sequence in eukaryotes. And so those non-coding sequences are removed and then the coding portions are spliced back together. The intervening sequences are called introns and they're the ones that are removed. And then the coding regions are called exons and they're spliced back together. So when we see something that looks like this, we've got our DNA sequence in the eukaryote cell and here's the messenger RNA that's, that's transcribed from that. We're going to remove the introns, the uh, intervening sequences that we don't need, and splice the, the exons back together and that's what happens in the cell before the messenger RNA leaves the nucleus. So that the portion that goes out to the nucleus, out to the cytoplasm, to attach to the ribosome is, um, is only the coding sequence plus the cap and the tail. This uh, produces something called, we can use reverse transcriptase to produce something called complementary DNA. So we can use that messenger RNA uh, to clone eukaryotic genes and eukaryotic cells. The reverse transcriptase is going to produce a DNA strand from the messenger RNA. This is the same enzyme that is found in uh, retroviruses like the HIV virus that, that, that have RNA as their genome. They also contain um, reverse transcriptase to change to make complementary DNA from messenger RNA. So what would be an advantage of doing this? Well, that's going to let us study genes that are responsible for very specialized characteristics of particular cell types. <coughs> and we can also get gene sequences that are smaller in size and easier to handle and don't have those introns that can be kind of messy when it comes to transcribing or translating it into a protein. So here we have the same thing. We have our DNA with our exons and introns. It's transcribed here. The RNA is spliced together. And then when we remove that from the nucleus, it goes out into the cell from the nucleus. We can uh, use the reverse transcriptase enzyme to make a complementary DNA strand. And then the RNA will be broken down, and then we'll synthesize the second DNA strand so that we've got a piece of DNA that codes for exactly what we want it to do. Another uh, thing that we often use in genetic engineering is nucleic acid probes. These are probes that bind selectively to the cloned DNA. They can be either DNA sequences or RNA sequences that are complementary to part of the gene that we're looking at and it's going to bind to that by base pairing and the probes are isolated or labeled with a radioactive isotope or some kind of fluorescent tag and that lets us see physically see where those uh, where those genes are and whether they've been picked up by the cell that we're trying to get them into. Uh, here's an example that shows you how the radioactive probe kind of binds to that single sanded part there and it's going to show up uh, much more easy it's going to show up much more easily and highlight the gene of interest that we're looking for. And this concludes the lesson on gene cloning.